Hey, fifth graders. All right, so this is going to be unit six, lesson five. Um, I'll give you the answers, of course, to lesson four. First, I won't make you wait until the end like I did last time. Sorry about that. Um, so, all right, uh, number one, was the bloodiest battle ever fought in North America? The answer is B, Gettysburg. Um, you might have been tempted to say A, uh, Antietam. Um, however, that was the bloodiest single day, um, whereas the Battle of Gettysburg went multiple days and ended up having way more casualties than uh, Antietam did. Uh, number two, what effect did the Emancipation Proclamation have on the Union Army? Um, <clears throat> well, since if you look through those, probably most of those seem, well, uh, it's A. That, that's, that's the answer. Number two, how did Clara Barton help the Union Army? Uh, so Clara Barton was one of the people that we talked about right at the very end of the last chapter, and one of the things that she did was she made food for the troops. Um, <clears throat> I feel like... Yeah. So basically, she served on the battlefield bringing food, medicine, and supplies to the wounded, and then she founded the American Red Cross. Um, so saying that she cared for the wounded, which would be D... I'd probably also take that one uh, just because it's close to what, what the book said. Um, so either A or D, or I'm sorry, either C or D uh, would be fine. <clears throat> How did the uh, march on Vicksburg help the Union finish the Anaconda Plan? Um, so the fall of Vicksburg is what gave the Union control of the Mississippi River. So you should say something about the effect of it gave them control of the Mississippi River, which split the Confederacy in, in half, or not in half, but in two parts. Number five, what was Pickett's Charge? During which battle did the charge take place? Okay, so Pickett's Charge was uh, when a whole bunch of Confederate troops charged up towards uh, the Union. It was in the Battle of Gettysburg, and it was a disaster. It was Pickett lost almost all of his men, uh, and it was you could probably make the argument that it was one of the worst decisions in military history by Robert E. Lee. Certainly, it was his worst decision because that was really the fall or the end of of his ability to uh, to win. Like, the, after after Pickett's charge, after the loss of Gettysburg, there was no way that they itself could win that war. Um, all right. So, vocabulary, which is the next page. Uh, number one, blank. The blank was a speech that Ab President Lincoln gave in honor of those who died in battle. That was the Gettysburg Address, which means number two is the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and then, oh, so you have a reading comprehension here. Sorry, I didn't always do that. I'd forgotten that I had this here. Um, so there's the little section from the Gettysburg Address, which I had already read to you. Um, so what does Lincoln say that people will always remember? Um, the thing they will always remember is the actions of the soldiers who fought in battle, in the battle. So that would be C. Uh, number two is Lincoln said the best way to honor the soldiers who died was to, um, basically see in the war, uh, continue their work. <clears throat> um, number three, in your opinion, why is the Gettysburg Address a famous speech in history? What qualities make the speech important or memorable? Okay, so this is totally your opinion, so whatever it is that you wrote is fine. Um, <clears throat> I, I hope that you didn't write, I don't think that it's memorable at all, and you know, that that's dumb, but since it's a question about your opinion, then it is entirely up to you what you wrote. Um, all right. So we are on to lesson five, or uh, yeah, lesson five. So now we're getting to the end of the war. I will have a lot less to say because there's fewer battles, and so I'm not going to like Civil War nerd out on you guys as much. So anyway, um, this is, uh, yeah, the war ends is what it's called. Uh, so less, or part A is the final battles. <clears throat> Ulysses S. Grant was a strong general who won important victories in the West. In 1864, Lincoln put Grant in command of the entire Union Army. He hoped Grant would bring the war to an end. So Lincoln, I see right after I say that I'm not going to nerd out on you guys here, I do it again anyway. Uh, so Lincoln had fired a number of generals over the course of the war. Um, he just couldn't seem to quite find the guy who uh, would would do things the way he wanted them done. Um <clears throat> Basically, what it amounts to is that a lot of the Union generals tend to be very, like, cautious and careful, and Lincoln was like, no, let's end this thing. We have more people. We should be able to win. And uh, Grant was, was that guy. There's some people who called Grant the butcher because he literally just, just marched his men through. He was like, it doesn't matter. The, uh, the Confederacy, you know, they have to kill 
almost three of our guys for every one of theirs that die, they can't keep up that that amount. We can beat them just by sheer overwhelming numbers. And so that was that was kind of his strategy. Um, <clears throat> however, you could make the argument that if he'd been in charge uh, in Antietam, the war would have ended years earlier. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, it's uh, it might not be great strategy all the time to just march your men straight through, but uh, it there's times where it could have worked, and the Union generals were definitely not uh, not being as aggressive as they should have been, and Grant was more aggressive. Anyway. Uh, Grant had two major goals. He wanted to destroy Lee's army in Virginia, and he wanted to capture Richmond, Virginia, the Confederate capital. For 40 days, from April to June uh, 1864, he battled Lee's army. The number of dead and wounded in these battles was enormous. The battle of Cold, in the Battle of Cold Harbor, Grant lost 7,000 men in about an hour. The Union army was so much larger than the Confederate army that it was able to continue its attacks. Finally, Grant reached Petersburg, a key railroad center south of Richmond. From there, he hoped to capture Richmond. Lee could not leave Petersburg. If he did, Grant would have a clear path to Richmond. With Lee trapped, Grant put Pit, uh, Petersburg under siege for 10 grim months. So this is not a case of like, you know, hey, we, we surround them and we keep them locked up for a week or two weeks or three weeks. This is almost a year <clears throat> of people just being stuck in... Uh, um, <clears throat> in a war zone, essentially. Uh, there's a picture on this page right there. That is an actual picture of Vicksburg, or I'm <clears throat> sorry, not Vicksburg, uh, Richmond, Virginia, after the war. So uh, Petersburg probably looked much the same uh, just from the amount of, of fighting that happened there. Uh, anyway, so people wondered if the war would ever end. Some Northerners wanted to let the Confederacy secede. So people just got to the point where they were just sick of the war. They'd been fighting for years. It was not ending. It was bloody. It was awful. It was, you know, if you remember back from when we talked about the first battle of Bull Run, there was people who were like having picnics. Like they went out to watch the battle with picnics. They did not realize what this war was going to be like. And it was awful. Um, <clears throat> and so it, you get to the point where you just get sick of it. You just want it to end. Uh, and that happens literally in every single war that we fight. Uh, there's always gets to be a growing number of people who are like, okay, we don't care. Just just let it be over. Okay? Nobody likes war. Um, so that, that starts happening here as well. Um, so people wondered if the war would ever end. Some Northerners wanted to let the Confederacy secede. Many blamed President Lincoln for continuing <clears throat> to uh, continuing the fight to keep the Union together. As a result, Lincoln felt he had little hope of winning re-election in 1864. So this war has, has literally been going on for the entirety of Lincoln's presidency, right? Like as soon as he was elected, uh, southern states started seceding. Now we're in 1864, so almost time for him to be, you know, potentially up for re-election, and the war is still going on. So it's been four years of fighting against other Americans, and people are just getting tired of it. And especially people in the North are getting tired of not always winning fights. That's that's kind of a big thing. All right. So William, uh, it's, I don't know how to say his middle name. We're going to say T. William T. Sherman led Union forces in the West following the Anaconda Plan. He marched his troops across Tennessee and Georgia to squeeze the South. He told his men to destroy anything of value to the enemy. Sherman soldiers terrorized the South. They burned crops and buildings. They destroyed railroads and factories. They even killed livestock and left animals for vultures. Sherman believed that the North needed to launch a total war which would break the South's fighting spirit. <clears throat> in September 1864, Sherman captured and burned Atlanta, Georgia, one of the South's largest cities and a railroad center. Sherman's 60,000-man army cut a 60-mile-wide and 300-mile-long path across Georgia to the city of Savannah on the Atlantic coast. The Union forces took Savannah in December. From there, the army marched into South Carolina, the state some people believed had started the war. Remember, they were the first ones to secede. Many cities in Sherman's path were left in ashes. One soldier said, here is where treason began, and here is where it shall end. With the fall of Atlanta, it seemed the end of the war was finally in sight. Northerners began to regain confidence in Lincoln and his ability to lead the Union to victory. In November of 1864, voters re-elected him. 
see the results of the election on the data graphic on this page. So there's a data graphic. I'll just kind of hold it up here for you. Uh, if you look there, you'll see that he won basically 90% of the uh, electoral vote, which is this one right here, and well over 50% of the popular vote down there. Um, <clears throat> he was going up against a Democrat nominee, uh, George McClellan, um, but George McClellan was not going to win. So anyway, all right, um, the South surrenders. On March 1865, Grant was closing in on Lee at Petersburg. After the Union siege, <clears throat> Confederate soldiers defending the city were near starvation. On April 2nd, Lee took his army west, hoping to find food and gather more Confederate troops. As a result, Petersburg fell. So it got to the point where Lee just had to, he had to leave. His, his men didn't have any food. They were running out of supplies, that sort of thing. So they had to go. Um, as a result, Petersburg fell. The next day, Richmond, the Confederate capital, also fell. Lee knew that more killing would be meaningless. The war was over. On April 9th, 1865, Lee surrendered to Grant at uh, Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. Grant did not take any prisoners. Instead, he offered Lee generous terms. For example, Lee and his soldiers were allowed to return to their home. They could also keep their horses to help with spring plowing. After Lee's surrender, Jefferson Davis fled westward where he hoped to keep the Confederacy alive. On May 10, 1865, he was captured by Union soldiers. Davis was later imprisoned for two years in Virginia. Okay, so a couple of things here. Um, one of them we're going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, so you'll notice that we have this several paragraphs talking about Lee's surrender, like the fall of, of Richmond and all that stuff, and Lee's surrender. And then we get just kind of this little blurb about Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis was the president of the Confederacy, whereas Robert E. Lee was a general. Now, when we talk about the Civil War, a lot of people almost think of it more as Robert E. Lee is leading the Confederacy, but he was a soldier. He was not, um, you know, he wasn't running the government or anything like that. And so, consequently, Jefferson Davis is almost the side note. Um, so I always kind of find that interesting. Um, now, one of the things that happens here, so Jefferson Davis, uh, when Richmond, Virginia fell, he and his family, they had already fled. They knew what was coming. They'd gotten out. Uh, so they headed west, and they had some plans for when they got to the west. They had kind of some plans of like, okay, maybe we could set things back up. Um, eventually, they had kind of their last official cabinet meeting. Um, Davis left uh, basically the treasury uh, in the care of one of his uh, men, who uh, one of his uh, cabinet members, and it just mysteriously disappeared somehow. Um, he eventually hoped to uh, to flee over to Europe and basically to have a government that's in exile over in Europe where they would sort of keep the Confederacy alive, except for when it would be a government without land, which is not really a government. It's just a, a group of guys who get together and talk about how cool they used to be. Um, but yeah, that was kind of his plans that he thought, you know, with... Basically, as it became clear that the Confederacy was not going to win, they had no hope of, of any sort of victory. He was hoping to get, you know, over into Europe and uh, uh, Great Britain in particular was a little bit, they didn't like the slavery thing, but at the same time, they were um, uh, a little bit sympathetic to, to the Confederates, uh, probably mostly because they liked Southern cotton. Um, but yeah, but an event happens in April that stops uh, any plans and any hope of any plans of Jefferson Davis to get out uh, the way uh, the way that he was hoping to. So uh, here's what happens. Abraham Lincoln is shot. Uh, Lincoln did not want to punish the South. In his second inaugural address, he encouraged Americans to put away their malice or desire to harm with these words. So that's what malice means, is desire to harm. With malice toward none, with charity for all. Less than a week after Lee's surrender, Lincoln was watching a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. A, suddenly, a gunshot rang out. John Wilkes Booth had shot the president. Okay, so John Wilkes Booth was an actor. In fact, he was a very famous actor. Um, there's a whole lot of information on John Wilkes Booth. He's kind of a fascinating guy, really. Uh, you know, he's crazy and bad, but fascinating nonetheless. Um, so, uh, books that I've read... Um, Killing Lincoln um, by Bill O'Reilly. I believe there's a uh, kid's version of it. Uh, Killing Lincoln is a very thick, very detailed book. I think the kid's version is probably a little simpler. 
Um, and you might even have it in the classroom. Of course, you guys don't have access to the classroom, but if you did, I'd probably have it there for you. If not, then I would get it. Um, but it's a very good book. Uh, also, you can watch a whole lot of videos online um, about John Wilkes Booth and like all the things that went in. They weren't just planning on killing Lincoln. He had a number of people who were working with him. They were planning on killing um, basically like Lincoln, several key members of the cabinet, uh, vice president, all that stuff. They were basically, they were trying to chop the head off of the, uh, of the union. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, of course didn't, didn't work. Lincoln was the only one who actually, uh, like he was the only key person who died. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it was, it was just kind of this really interesting thing that happened. And there's a lot of like little things that, oh my gosh, if this had just gone one way, you know, we might have had Lincoln survive, and, and the history here to come might have been very different. Um, however, it didn't. It, it, it happened the way it did. Now, uh, with Lincoln's assassination, you know, all we knew was, or all the people at the time knew, was that Abraham Lincoln had been shot, and he's shot in the head, and he, he actually does survive for a little while. You know, this is not a high-powered gun like we have nowadays. Um, this was a, a lower-powered, lower lower-caliber gun. Um, so Lincoln does survive for like another day, but I mean, really the amount of damage done, uh, he was going to die no matter what. So you can't get shot in the head and survive, uh, too frequently and certainly not back then. Um, <clears throat> so Lincoln, uh, Lincoln does die. They actually take him, um, across the street to, uh, to a house that was over there and, and, you know, bring a doctor in and all this stuff, but, but Lincoln never recovers. Um, so yeah, uh, nobody knew what had happened. Uh, John Wilkes Booth and his guys, they actually get out of Washington, D.C., which was pretty impressive that they managed to even pull that off. But they get away, temporarily at least. Uh, so consequently, they don't. <clears throat> nobody in Washington, D.C. or the North or anything like that knows like who all was involved in this plot. Like How, how did this happen? And so as they piece this together and as they kind of figure things out, and really once they track down John Wilkes Booth, because they do hunt him down and they, they capture him and a whole bunch of other people uh, who are all involved, um, once that happens, then they kind of find out more information. But at first they think this was Jefferson Davis ordered, you know, somebody to kill Abraham Lincoln. That's probably what happened. You know, obviously the Confederacy would like Abraham Lincoln to die so that they can, you know, win. This is not really, it's after the, uh, after Lee's surrender, just a week later, basically. Um, but, uh, you know, there's there's still people who are fighting the war. The war doesn't end just because a general surrendered, um, and so consequently, uh, a lot of people thought that that maybe this was a Confederacy, uh, like an official Confederacy action. Um, as it turns out, it it was not. Uh, so when this happens, Jefferson Davis, <clears throat> um, he can't get away. Uh, nobody in Europe will touch this guy now because if if you take in the guy who just assassinated the president of another country, that's like declaring war on that other country. And they, they don't want that. It would forever end <clears throat> any, uh, you know, any trading agreements or whatever with Great Britain and the United States. That would be over. Great Britain knows this. There's no way they're going to take Jefferson Davis. So Jefferson Davis just kind of has to flee and hide out. Uh, um, Andrew Johnson becomes the uh, the new uh, president. He's the vice president, and he becomes the president. And so, consequently, um, he uh, he puts out a bounty on Jefferson Davis. And I don't remember what the exact number is, but in today's money, it would have been over a million dollars, like one point five million dollars, something like that. So, a lot of money for this one guy. Um, so, Davis is hiding out. And he eventually is, um, is found. They're still trying to make plans for how they can escape and it's not looking good. Um, when he is found, uh, there's sort of a, it's kind of one of those things where like the, the, the Northern army says one thing and then the South say another thing. And it's, you know, one group is trying to make the other person look bad. And one group is trying to protect that person's dignity because they respect him. Uh, I think, probably the truth might actually be more with what the South is saying. Uh, but the Northern soldiers, when they find him, he has on a woman's shawl. So he's got like some women's clothing on. Um, the, the Northern soldiers, of course, in the Northern newspapers report that uh, Jefferson Davis 
was a coward who was trying to flee and he was dressed as a woman uh, trying to get away. Uh, in the South, they say, and, and his wife has said, uh, that no, no, he was just really sick, and so she had given him her shawl, and she was wearing that to, uh, or he was wearing that to just because he was not feeling well, and it was like trying to keep him warm. He had a cold. Um, probably the South is telling the truth, but yeah, you never know. Maybe he was just trying to sneak away, and, and you know, they were looking for a guy, so they might not have uh, um, captured him if, if they thought that he was a woman. I don't know, but uh, it's just kind of a funny thing. So anyway. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So we were at uh, John Wilkes Booth shot the president. Uh, the next morning, April 15th, 1865, Lincoln died. Abraham Lincoln's assassination shocked the nation. This was, by the way, the first president to ever be assassinated. Uh, a couple of people have tried to assassinate presidents in the past, but this is the first time that somebody actually pulls it off. Uh, the second one is going to be just 16 years later. So we have, you know, 87 years of no presidents being killed, and then we have two within 20 years of each other, which is kind of crazy. Um, so assassination is the murder of an important leader. Poet Walt Whitman expressed, uh, expressed the country's sadness, and he says, Oh, captain, my captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship is weathered every storm. The prize we sought is won. That's Walt Whitman. Uh, who is a, uh, a poet um, in reference to Abraham Lincoln and his, his death. Okay, so at the end of the war, the South had few farms left in working condition. Troops returned not only to the property that had been destroyed, but to a way of life that had ended. In the South, one of every four white men had been killed. So 25% of the Southern states' men were dead. <clears throat> Two-thirds of its wealth had been lost. It would take many years for the South to recover, one Confederate soldier returning home to Richmond wrote, I shall not attempt to describe my feelings. The city is in ruins. With a raging headache and a swelling heart, I reach my home. And, there, and here the curtain falls. The Union had survived, but the cost of the Civil War had been huge. Uh, the North's victory ended slavery for millions of African Americans. At the same time, it left the South in ruins. United once again, the nation faced the task of rebuilding the South. And again, just as a reminder, this is what Richmond, Virginia looked like when the soldiers came back to it after, after the Civil War. So um, Richmond, Virginia was a very pretty, pretty city previously, not so much when they come back. Okay, that ends this lesson. Uh, so we have one more lesson in Unit 6, and then uh, we'll be moving on to Unit 7, which if you've not uh, not gotten it yet, there will be a packet for Unit 7 that I will both email out and probably have uh, at the school for you guys to pick up. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that's all I got for you. But anyway, have a good one. I'll talk to you later.